All right. Last week we started Joseph, the husband of Mary. Uh, we looked at some of the facts surrounding Joseph, the fact that uh, he's from Nazareth. Uh, he is of the lineage of David, Matthew chapter 1. Uh, he was a carpenter. The term is actually artisan or a worker with one's hands, someone who was skilled uh, with their hands. And so whether he was a carpenter or a silversmith or whatever it was, that's what uh, that's what he, he did. Apparently taught Jesus to do the same thing. And it sounds as though by the time Jesus is on the cross, Joseph may have died uh, because Jesus takes careful care to make sure his mother's taken care of by John the Apostle. If his father or Joseph had still been alive, there wouldn't have been any reason uh, for that. And Jesus being the firstborn, uh, it was his responsibility to see to the care of his mother. So uh, it would seem as though Joseph passed away at some point before Jesus, certainly before Jesus died, probably before Jesus started his ministry. All right, so we, we're into, uh, we'll get into the character of Joseph. And like we, we looked at last week, he's only really mentioned in terms of of his character and, and, and events for Joseph in Matthew chapter 1 and 2 and Luke chapter 1 and 2. Uh, really the only chapters we have regarding Joseph specifically. So in Luke chapter 2, we see starting in verse 1, it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. We see verses 7 on through verse uh, 18 and 19, that Jesus is born, there's the shepherds involved and so forth. Uh, and in starting in verse 21, when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And then in verse 22, now in the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of tur turtle doves or two young pigeons. So one of the things that we see regarding Joseph is that even though he was from Nazareth, and of course Matthew records, uh, there's, a, there's a, kind of, a lot of stuff going on in this process as well. Uh, Luke's record is a bit succinct. Matthew goes into a little bit more detail in terms of, of what was going on with Herod and Bethlehem and so forth. Uh, but we see that, that uh, Joseph was, he was obedient to the law of Moses, obviously. Uh, that's clear from the, the circumcising of Jesus, the fact that they took him to the temple in Jerusalem to offer the sacrifices that were commanded in the law. It also shows that he was an obedient citizen. He, he submitted to the census. He was willing to go all the way to Bethlehem because that's where, being of the house of David, that was the city of David. And so even though he was from Nazareth, he had to go to Bethlehem uh, for the census of the Roman Empire. And he was willing to do that. And so uh, that's, that's just one thing that we see from Joseph, which obviously is included in the law of Christ as well, the need for us to be obedient to the civil authorities, uh, obviously putting God first in those things as well. Anything through that particular point on Joseph? All right. Uh, in Luke chapter 2, we see going further, and again, this is something that Matthew, he doesn't include this, these events in Jerusalem, uh, but Luke does. Here in verse 25, Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, 
Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. So we have this individual Simeon, uh, only recorded here in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, information about this man yeah, he, as well as John the Baptist, were both told that they would see the, the Messiah, uh, the fulfillment of the prophecy. Uh, Simeon is one, uh, John the Baptist was the other, which is recorded in John chapter 1, chapter 2. And then we see the fact in verse 33, Joseph and his mother marveled. Why doesn't it just say his mother and father marveled? Or why not just say Joseph and Mary marveled? Oh, does it really? <laughs> what is the, what, what translation do you have? The new, oh, the American Standard. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, well, Joseph and his mother, oh, that, that, that we have a little thing here. The American Standard, his father and mother. It's interesting. Well, at least it, for the uh, King James, the manuscripts, it has Joseph and his mother. And it's one of those, those points that it, it goes back to show that Joseph, yes, he was the head of the household and legally the father of Jesus, but in reality, he wasn't. Okay, Mary obviously was Jesus' mother, uh, but you know, God brought about the birth of Jesus through miraculous means, and Joseph was not involved in that. Uh, so I, I just thought that was, that was interesting. I didn't, I didn't realize the American Standard has father and mother, but regardless, it's, it's the understanding that Joseph wasn't his biological father. But anyway, we see in verse 33 that they marveled at those things that were spoken by Simeon. The things that Simeon, the things that he's saying, of course, at this point, uh, they've received these angels. Uh, Joseph has had several occasions where he's received visions from the Lord, uh, with the Lord speaking to him. And he's going to continue to have several visions after this. Uh, but the fact that this is all such a, it's, it's a big deal. And I think Mary and Joseph are both starting to kind of come to terms with the fact that this is a big deal. Uh, it wasn't just, I mean, obviously this was the, uh, prophesied. This was told to them, this is what's going to happen. Uh, all, so far, God has guided them through this. But now to have this man, Simeon, offer up these, these words to Jehovah, the fact that this individual, my eyes have seen your salvation which you prepared before the face of all peoples to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Uh, I think that's really interesting that he included the Gentiles in, in that uh, this praise of God. It, it seems as though Simeon, he at least had an understanding from God. He was full of the Spirit, certainly, and from the prophecies uh, that the Gentiles would be a part of this process that Jesus was going to accomplish. Anything through that point about Joseph uh, marveling at the things that we see from, that he hears from Simeon. All right. Uh, Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. So we're done in Luke for the time being. Matthew chapter 1 going into verse 19. We have the, again, this is the genealogy of Joseph. And then in Luke, we have the genealogy of Mary. Uh, and so starting at verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. So first of all, what we see here is that they were betrothed. Sometimes people interchange the word betrothed in their culture with engaged in our culture. It's not exactly the same thing. Betrothed was in essence married, but there was a period of about a year before they would consummate the marriage. So they were married. Uh, if you're engaged, you're not married yet, which is why 
it wouldn't make sense if they were just engaged to be married that Joseph would divorce her uh, for adultery. That wouldn't make any sense. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that they are married. Okay, They are husband and wife. They simply haven't consummated the marriage yet. And so Joseph, her husband, being a just man, what does the term just mean? Huh? Righteous, fair, upright. Uh, primarily, the term carries with it the idea of, of pure, have been pure in heart, pure in motivation. Uh, the desire to please God certainly goes with that, the idea of godliness. Okay, being a just man also includes the recognition of the law. Okay, so he, he knew what the law was, but he also took into consideration uh, Mary's situation. And let's go ahead and look at one of our questions here. Uh, we'll get to question one here in just a minute. In what way was Joseph being a just man applicable to the situation of Mary being pregnant? Why is it important for Matthew to point out here that Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not wanting to make a public example? Why is the fact that he was a just man important in this? Okay, there is no anger or, or, or malice. There is, he wasn't vindictive. And I think that that's part of this, co this concept of, yes, there was the recognition of what the law says. Okay, and certainly that, com that component is there. But then also there's the consideration of the effect this is going to have on Mary. And, and it does go to show that he cared quite a bit about Mary, doesn't he? Right, right. Just because something's been done wrong to her doesn't mean, or him, doesn't mean he should retaliate in, re, in response, right? And that's part of what Paul describes in Romans chapter 12 uh, and many other places as well. The fact that when we're, when we're persecuted, we don't respond in kind. We don't respond with anger to anger and so forth. Uh, but that idea of him being a just person, he takes the law. Here's what the law says. But he had, and this goes back to, would Joseph have been within his rights to put her away? Why would he not want to make her a public example? Why wouldn't he want to make her a public example? Yeah, he loves her, okay? Certainly he wants to, he wants to consider what might become of her as a result. Certainly being put away made a public example, which he could easily have done, would have kind of made her a pariah uh, in society, and so it's, he certainly would have been within his rights to do that. And would he have been within his rights to put her away under the Mosaical law? Absolutely. Uh, according to the law of Moses, as it was given, okay, the cause of, of uncleanness or, 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 or issue of, of defilement that he found within her, um, she's pregnant. There's only one way that happens. So yeah, this, he was in his rights to do that. But this is why this event takes place in Matthew chapter 1 and 19, or in verse uh, 20. While he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying. So what we see is that Joseph, and we're not, we don't know uh, all of Joseph's background, and, but I would imagine this is a kind of a, it reads almost emotionless on paper, think there's there's a lack of emotion taking place here anybody in that situation there's going to be a lot of emotion going on and one of the things that we talk about on a regular basis is the need for scripture to inform emotion not for emotion to inform scripture okay our emotions don't get to dictate what god says god says and therefore we allocate our emotions accordingly and one of the situations here is Joseph, he loved Mary. He does not want her to be a public spectacle. He doesn't want her to, to have to deal with anything more than what she has to deal with as it is. And so he's going to put her away secretly or privately. Okay, he doesn't want this to be a public knowledge type of situation. Uh, and 
certainly shows his character there of his care for her, his care for her future, what's going to come of her, and his care for the law. All right, so anything through that particular point? Yes, sir, Doug. Yeah. Well, and you know, and, and that kind of brings up. Yeah. Well, and that kind of brings up an interesting situation is obviously she figured it out at some point. Obviously, she has to approach Joseph and tell him while at the same time telling him, I have no idea how this happened. Joseph is having to, to deal with this fact that I would assume she is saying that I didn't, I didn't do this, okay? This, this isn't my fault. I didn't do anything wrong. Uh, so I would assume that she's saying that, and he's having to take that along with the evidence that she's pregnant and say, well, obviously something happened, and he's having to kind of deal with all of this, and I can only imagine his mental state and his emotional state having to, to deal. In fact, in verse 19, or verse 20, rather, while he thought about these things, uh, while he thought about these things, you almost wonder if it's while he's battling in his mind over how did this happen. She, uh, it doesn't say that she's claiming innocence here, but obviously she is innocent. Okay, and I would assume that she would have said, I'm innocent. So how exactly did this happen? And this is when the angel of the Lord speaks to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So you can imagine, first, the relief, okay, probably that Joseph had, uh, the fact that she didn't do anything wrong, first of all, uh, and his care for her and his love for her is not having to, to kind of battle the fact that she's, she's done something wrong. She hasn't. But now you've also got added to that that this is, I mean, is this a, a normal occurrence here? Absolutely not. All right. This is very, very, very unique, singularly unique. And so he's having to kind of come to terms with that as well, that my wife's going to give birth to the Messiah. Uh, just uh, just uh, think of the overwhelming component to that, hearing all of this news all at once. And in verse 22, So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. And then in verse 24, Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife. So you see Joseph, do you see any hesitation on his part? See any hesitation? Obviously, this dream he had, it was clear that it wasn't a normal dream also. Okay, you got to figure that. Because it wasn't like he woke up and started debating in himself, did, this, did that really just happen? Was the angel of the Lord speaking to me in a dream? Or was it, did I just dream that? Okay, obviously there was something about it that made clear that this is God speaking to him. Uh, and Joseph didn't hesitate. He didn't question. It, he accepted it and moved along the way God wanted him to. He took Mary as his wife. And in verse 25, he did not know her, didn't consummate the marriage until she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he called his name Jesus. So you have this, this incredible event, which, which, which was fraught with emotion, certainly, both love and uh, not malice or anger necessarily, but certainly upset over the situation that must have been. And then he has a dream, which was clearly a, a dream from God, and he just accepts it all. He just takes it kind of in stride. Again, Knowing as human beings, I'm sure there was a lot he's having to, 
to kind of process in his mind. But there's not a single thing in here that suggests that he hesitated or argued or, or still wanted to put her away anyway. None of that. Thoughts or comments through this? You know, I don't know. I don't know. And I don't know how common it would have been for that first year or so of a marriage for the wife to get pregnant during that year when they're waiting to consummate the marriage. Maybe that was more common culturally. And so people may have just assumed that they didn't quite make a year. I, I don't know. Other thoughts or comments? But yeah, I mean, it was supposed that Joseph was the father. We, we know that from, from Luke. Anything else? All right, going back to our notes real quick. So uh, we see that uh, Joseph would have been within his rights to put her away. He didn't want to make her a public example because he loved her. He cared about her. Uh, he could have easily reacted with anger and revenge regarding Mary's perceived adultery, but he didn't. And we see he obeys the voice of the angel of the Lord each time that this happens, that, this, that the, this dialogue in a dream comes to him. And in each instance, the angel appears to Joseph in a dream. Every single time that this happens, it's always the angel of the Lord speaking to Joseph through a dream. Which again suggests, I mean, you know, some of our dreams, depending on who you are and what you dream about, sometimes dreams are very vivid. And when, by the time you wake up, I mean, there have been times I've woken up and actually thought that, you know, this happened in my head. You know, I, that actually happened and then I had to think about it a bit. No, that was just a dream. Okay, you have sometimes vivid dreams for different reasons. This must have been very, very different than just your typical even vivid dream. This must have been obvious that this is from God. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 24, we see that. We go forward to Matthew chapter 2. We see in verse 7 and 8, we have the situation with the wise men and Herod. Herod feels threatened by the idea of a king being born uh, that threatens his authority and his power. He, wants to, he claims he wants to come and worship the child. Uh, verse 12, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Uh, and then in verse 13, now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt, and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I called my son. Again, Seemingly no hesitation, no argumentation here. And this process, they're in Bethlehem for the, the census. The time comes, she gives birth. Uh, again, a period of time takes place. They're still in Bethlehem, apparently, because that's where the wise men go. And at that point, they find them in a house, not in a manger, as is commonly depicted. Uh, and after this, when Herod's all upset, verse 16... Who does he, what, what age of young boys does he put to death in Bethlehem? Two years and under. Not just newborns, okay, which meant that Jesus could have been up to two years old at the point that the wise men had come to see Jesus. Uh, and at, at least at this point when Herod is, is going to kind of, in his anger, uh, take it out on the little kids of, of Bethlehem. So from two years old and un under, according to the time which he determined from the wise men, uh, and so he puts all those male children to death. And then in verse 19, when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the young child's life are dead. So, verse 21, Joseph arose, he takes the young child and his mother, comes to the land of Israel, when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, so he didn't go to Judea. Being warned by God again in a dream, he turned aside into the region of Galilee, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. And of course, as we know from Luke's account, that's where 
Joseph had come from to start with, that he was from Nazareth to, to begin with, went to Bethlehem for the census, then went to Egypt, or well, went to Bethlehem, then went to Jerusalem at, on the eighth day to, for the circumcision and to offer the sacrifices, went back to Bethlehem, then went to Egypt, waited out until Herod died, then they were heading into Judea, Aris, uh, let's see, well, Ar Archelaus is governor or reigning there, and so he doesn't go into Judea. Instead, he goes into Galilee to Nazareth, which is for him, at least, going back home. Thoughts or comments through that? Okay. So, uh, let's see. What characteristics do we find in Joseph's obedience to both the law of Caesar as well as the Mosaical law? Because there were a lot of Jews who, just out of spite, wouldn't want, have wanted to obey Caesar anyway. In any way that they could, they rebelled against Caesar, for a lot of them. Yeah, yeah, Joseph was willing to do that. Okay, and I think you see within that the understanding that, it, it, in a lot of ways, again, we have very little in terms of Joseph's personality, uh, Joseph's history or past, but what we do see seems to be an individual who's very, not, I don't want to use the phrase laid back, but very calm. I would say calm. At least what's depicted to us, what's given to us, he seems to be able to just kind of go with the punches, go with the flow, things that happen, okay, he just kind of goes, goes along as best he can and adapts. Uh, and Joseph seems to do that very well, especially in the times where God is speaking to Joseph through these dreams and so forth, telling him what to do and where to go. And Joseph just, he does it. He, he, does, he doesn't question, much, much like Abraham being called out of his father's house. So I, I think in a lot of ways you see Joseph's ability to adapt to changing situations here. Anything else? Certainly, he's obeying God by being obedient to uh, those who are in charge. Certainly, he's obeying the laws of the Jews. And part of the laws of the Jews from the Sanhedrin was to, uh, at least to a point, follow what the Romans told them to do. The third question, what characteristics do we see from Joseph each time he received direction from the angel of the Lord? Yeah, he did what he was told, and it doesn't sound like God had to tell him twice. Okay, which again speaks to the nature of the dreams that he's having, that these are clearly from God. But also, there's, there doesn't seem to be any debate here going on about, well, should, should I really go to Egypt? I mean, I don't want to go to Egypt. I don't know that Joseph Avetta had ever been to Egypt. To go someplace he'd never been before, much like, again, like Abraham. Uh, but... He was willing to do that. Uh, I mean, all of the stuff that we see from Joseph shows his immediate submission to the Lord. And there's a, a, a lot of components to that that uh, really make Joseph an interesting individual. I wish we had more on Joseph. I wish, I wish we had more about his character. Uh, uh, but what we do have certainly shows, as we're told in Matthew, a just man. Anything on that? Anything else on that? All right. Go with me to Luke real quick. Yeah, how much, how much impact? Yeah. Yeah. As a, as a child. Right. Uh, you know, the second record is, you know, when he's 10 years old and he's losing, he's about his father's business. Right. So we, we see some, a transition already from a child to, to some knowing who he is. Right. Right. Yeah, and it is interesting to think about, I mean, because, you, you, again, we read these people on the page of the Bible, and sometimes we forget that these are 
human beings with their own personalities, with their own fears, their own struggles, with their own faith, their own culture, okay, and kind of appreciating and realizing, kind of putting ourselves in their shoes for a little bit, realizing that, I mean, I'm sure Joseph had influence on, on Jesus. I'm sure he did. Uh, I, I, obviously, it, it was all positive, at least what Jesus took from it, because there, Jesus never did anything wrong. Uh, but I would imagine that God, uh, certainly in choosing Joseph and Mary to be the custodians, the guardians of Jesus, certainly not only chose Mary for a reason, but chose Joseph for a reason as well. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 That's true. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, like you say, just the just the, the the overwhelming nature. Like for instance, when they're listening to Simeon and what Simeon is saying, and they marvel at the things that Simeon says. Probably not so much that it's it's how he said it; it's what he said about Jesus that they're marveling, uh, and the fact that this was all according to the plan. This was all according to the promise of God, the prophecies, and so forth. Uh, and so all of that. I, I just, I can't imagine how overwhelming that must have been. Uh, but they, I mean, as parents, anyone who's been a parent knows you, 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 you handle it. Whether you think you can or not, you handle it. And you just, you move forward as best you can. And of course, I'm sure, you know, Jesus was, uh, well, Jesus was literally the perfect child. But they also had five more boys or four, four more boys and then some daughters as well at some point. Uh, so... Yeah. All right. Anything else about that? So very quickly, I want to note that there's a couple of commentaries that claim we have two separate accounts of Jesus's birth, one in Matthew chapter one and a little bit into chapter two, and then another different one in here in Luke chapter two. So in Luke chapter two, we see the, the same thing that Matthew observes about the, uh, the census that is going out. And we see in verse uh, 4, Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. So keep in mind that Matthew picks up and they're already in Bethlehem. Okay, Matthew doesn't talk about Joseph having come from Nazareth or anything like that. He just picks up in Bethlehem and here's Joseph and his betrothed wife and she's with child and it comes time for her to give birth and so forth. Uh, verse six. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. So we see the situation with Jesus being born. We see the shepherds here in verse eight and nine and 10 with the angel speaking to uh, the shepherds. There's the heavenly host speaking. And then in verse 16, they came with haste, found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. When they'd seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told to them concerning this child. All those who heard it marveled at those things which were told by them, uh, uh, told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Uh, now, again, we, we talk about the harmony of the Gospels and how different Gospel writers tend to focus in on certain details. And where there are some details in one account, different details, maybe not the same ones, different ones uh, of the same event are focused on in another account. Well, with this one, we see, Matt, or with uh, Luke, we see kind of the focus on the shepherds and on this, this the glory of this uh, uh, event of, of, of the Lord being born. Uh, we see in verse 20, they are praising God for all the things that they've heard and seen as it was told them. Matthew's account, okay, after Jesus is born, then we go forward in time a little bit until the wise men come along. Okay, so Matthew doesn't record basically everything for the rest of Luke chapter 2, 
Luke does record it. These aren't two different accounts. They're the same account, the same event, but with, more, with certain details in one and other details in another. And it just, it, when, I was, when I was studying up, preparing for, for Joseph, I'm reading from a couple of these commentaries that, oh, these are two different accounts, and, and scholars, some scholars aren't sure which account is accurate, which one's the right one, and so forth, but they share some details, so those details are probably accurate. It, it's all true, and there's no reason to think that it's not. There's nothing contradictory here. Uh, eight days were completed, they go up to Jerusalem, or well, I'm sorry, at, now, when the days of purification, according to the law, they went to Jerusalem. Uh, so it wasn't after specifically eight days. He was circumcised on the eighth day, but then after the days of, her purif of Mary's purification were done, they went to the temple. They offered up the sacrifice as was commanded. Then we have Simeon here. None of this is recorded in Matthew. Again, Matthew, he kind of uh, goes forward in time quite a bit throughout that account. Uh, we see in verse... 36, there's another one, Anna. There was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age. He had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. This woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. Coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Really interesting how from verse 36 to verse 38, something that kind of often gets glossed over. You've got this woman named Anna. She's a prophetess. She's elderly. Okay, She's been a widow for quite some time. And she's, in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption. Presumably, the, Jesus is who she's talking about. Uh, that would make sense given the context. That's what Simeon was talking about was Jesus. It would make sense that Anna in that instant, uh, whether she's passing through or whatever and sees Jesus, whatever the case is, she's a prophetess, remember, uh, and she starts talking about this. So in verse 39, when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. Now, this is where a lot of the commentaries say this is two separate accounts because we know that they went back to Bethlehem in Matthew, then they stayed for a while while the census was being done. That wasn't an overnight do it online type of thing. And then the uh, wise men come along, then they go to, to Egypt, the uh, Joseph, Mary, and, and Jesus go to Egypt for a period of time. But then Luke picks up verse 39. Luke picks up after they've done all of that. They've gone to Egypt, Herod has died, and now they've come back. Now they've performed all things to the law. According to the law, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. According to Matthew, they went back to Nazareth after all those events happened with the wise men and with uh, Herod and Egypt and so forth. There is nothing contradictory here. And then we see the child grew strong, became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, grace of God was upon him. All right. Anything else about Joseph? All right, that's it for Joseph. We will, um, I'll have the notes, our next notes for our Old Testament. We keep going New Testament, Old Testament, and I'll email those notes out and have them on the table Sunday for everybody for next Wednesday. Thank you, everybody.